get started. Um, my name is Ryan Betts. I am from VolkDB. VolkDB is a little database company. We're located in Massachusetts, not too far outside of Boston. So two Boston area companies back to back talking here all the way in Berlin. Uh, so I'd like to talk about two things today. I wasn't quite sure when I planned this talk. Oh, that's much louder. Uh, who the audience would be, or even how much time I might have. So. I decided to talk about two things, hoping that I would cover my bases. I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the problems that we hear uh, about from customers that we have when we talk about VoltDB, specifically around big data, which is a little bit different from just lots of data. It's a slightly different problem. And then I would like to talk a little bit about some of the technical distinctions in VoltDB and what makes VoltDB different from some of the systems that we've heard about in the last couple of days. And uh, interrupt at any time with questions. If you have uh, anything you can't understand or if I speak too quickly, please let me know. So uh, the problem. Uh, the first problem that we hear about is that people have lots and lots of transactions, 10,000 transactions a second, a million transactions a second. And they need to be able to manage this large throughput uh, of largely write-based workloads. Uh, and the transactions themselves don't really represent a substantial revenue source. Like no one's paying, right, handle this transaction, I'll give you a dollar, right? That's not the way it works. So the transactions need to be very cheap to process. It has to be uh, you know, not even pennies of tra or per, per dollar to process one of these transactions. Uh, and finally, the kinds of applications that people have, they have lots of streaming rights. They have a large volume of rights. Uh, but they also see a real business value in being able to do consistent summary aggregates of some of that data, right? And I, we're going to walk through some examples of that. Uh, a lot of these problems I summarize in my in casual conversation as kind of giant, sky, <laughs> giant scoreboards in the sky. Um, I don't know. I don't know if cribbage is a very popular game in Germany, but it's a really fun game. So something to check out. If it's not popular yet, perhaps it soon will be. The little pitch for cribbage. And cribbage you score very frequently during the game. And so instead of writing the score down on a piece of paper, you advance pegs on a board to indicate the score. Uh, so those are kind of like the, the right update streams that you see. They're frequent. And you need to be efficient at it. Uh, however, it's useless just to know your own score without knowing it relative to the other players. Right? So you need to be able to look across the pegs of the board to be able to, to figure out where the pegs are with relationship to each other. And in the cases that we see, this is something that people want to do in a consistent fashion. And consistency is important. Right? In this case, a wrong answer is worse than no answer at all. Uh, you also would like to know certain special events. Right? For example, the first player to cross the finish line wins. This is something that you need to know and that you need to know consistently. We see this pattern in a lot of different places and in different uh, types of companies that we speak to. We see it, for example, in financial tick streams, where someone, uh, for example, um, an electronic trader, has a large volume of trades open to the market on a large number of stocks. And they're receiving a stream from the market of the price of those stocks and on the fate of the trades that they've offered. Uh, that stream may be 100,000 to 2 million writer update transactions a second. Uh, but they need to be able to track uh, various summaries of those trades. They want to know their position against a certain stock, or, or they have lots of algorithms trading. They'd like to be able to trade or compare the algorithms with one another uh, in near real time. So that happens maybe thousands of times a second, right? but at a much lower rate than the rights. However, there's a lot of value in being able to handle that small rate. And similar things happen in different sensor inputs. So as I said, we see this in a large number of places. We see it in uh, financial. Uh, applications, what I just mentioned, we see it uh, related to digital advertising and telco call record management. In each case, there's a slightly different transaction mix, of course, for each of these applications. But in all the cases, there's business value in being able to handle a consistent summary at the same time that you're scaling the high write throughput. So what's the challenge? Uh, this slide isn't quite my style. I stole this from the marketing guy. And I think it has a, a fancy PowerPoint reveal. So. You need to be able to validate data in real time. So as you're receiving these rights, you need to be able to alert on values. You need to be able to, to validate. And as you're processing the stream of incoming data, you need to be able to count and aggregate. Uh, the Cassandra guys earlier in the talk, they gave a, a presentation on how counting is hard. And 
In a lot of ways, that's what this is about, right? Sometimes simply counting accurately at scale is a really hard problem. And sometimes you just need to count. You don't need to do that much more beyond that. If you could just calculate that, you'd be in good shape. Uh, you need to be able to enrich data in real time. Uh, you may be able to look at a, a state of data, uh, receive an incoming message, and you would like to be able to append some summary of the state to that incoming message, right? Enrichment. Uh, so, uh, and, then, and then once you've enriched that data, you'd like to store it or maybe forward it to another system for storage or further processing. And you need a system that scales, obviously. And learn and adapt. Um, so we, when we say learn and adapt, what we mean is you want to be able to access your data efficiently so that you can process it in a number of different ways. And that really just means that you have to move the processing closer to the data some way. So VoltDB versus these criteria, uh, kind of versus this slice of the big data problem. So we're going to talk about Volt's design a little bit. Almost all of Volt's major design points are biased towards throughput. Uh, Volt runs on commodity hardware, right? This is Typical, many people make this choice these days. Um, and it's a clustered system. It scales very well node to node. And it has some clever choices in its design that enables it to scale. And I'd like to talk about that a little bit. So I'm going to walk through some of the design decisions in Volt. These two decisions aren't really controversial, right? Everyone's doing this. Everyone these days has some kind of a system that scales across commodity hardware. and Pretty much everyone replicates for fault tolerance. But there are some things in Volt that are really different and that make it really applicable to some of these high volume stream kind of um, write heavy workloads. So one is that Volt is fully transactional. Everything in Volt is ACID. Uh, and in Volt, a transaction is a stored procedure invocation. This sounds kind of weird at first. And I think it helps a little bit to, to know what a Volt stored procedure looks like. So a Volt stored procedure is essentially a Java class with a run method. That method takes parameters. And the user can use Java for control flow while using SQL for data access. And there's an example of a procedure later on. It will hopefully be a little clearer. So in Volt, one transaction, one stored procedure. There's no like begin transaction, do work, do work, do work, do work, and transaction back and forth between a client and a server. Right? It's one invocation from the client executed transactionally as a stored procedure. The second is that Volt gets rid of all of the stalls during a transaction. So there's no disk waits during a transaction. And as I said, there's not any uh, server client chattiness over the network in the middle of a transaction. So once a transaction begins to run, it runs to completion. And this is really fast because, it's, well, because Volt's also an in-memory system. So no disk waits, right? Volt manages concurrency a little bit differently from some of the other systems we've talked about. So Volt does concurrency by scheduling, not by locked access to data, and not by MVCC. Uh, so in Volt, we basically organize all the work we want to do in a batch. This is like a latency throughput trade-off. And then once that work is ordered, it can just execute against a partition of data. And that, because nothing blocks in the middle of a transaction, that execution can all happen um, serially, right? So the transaction starts, you know it's going to end very shortly, and it can just get a kind of uh, pure access to the data without any other contention. And that's really important on modern CPUs. So just to summarize, Volt is strictly ACID and transactional. Uh, if you like to think in terms of CAP, Volt is strictly consistent. A Volt cluster can tolerate failure. Um, you, can, you can lose a node from a Volt cluster and re rejoin that node and remain available. But if push comes to shove and there's a fault that's ambiguous, right? Volt will always choose to remain consistent versus available. So if you put all these decisions together, what do you get? Like, what's, what's the interesting thing? So this is a little bit of a picture from uh, our continuous integration harness. What this is showing is Volt single node performance on TPCC. Who here is familiar with TPCC? All right, so TPCC is an OLTP workload. Um, it was defined a long time ago, and it's not particularly relevant in its entirety of the specification to modern databases. It has some weird scaling things. The faster you go, the more data you need to store, which is not really a great quality in a benchmark. Um, however, it defines some, some interesting transactions. It has, um, I don't know, seven or eight different transactions, and they average about 20 SQL statements apiece. So what this graph is showing is that on a single node, we're doing about 50,000 of these procedures a second. That's about a million SQL statements a second on one server. 
Uh, and the graph is graphing both the per node throughput for a three node cluster and a six node cluster, two different runs in the same graph. And you can see like near linear scale. So some guys at Procona, they did some math. They put this through a little emulator, a kind of a planning tool they have. And they determined that Volt would scale to 39 servers, 1.6 million complex transactions a second. We've actually run Volt on, on more than 20 large servers that were kindly donated to us by SGI on a less complex transaction type. And we're able to do 3 million transactions a second continuously for a month or so before we had to end the experiment. So Volt's really fast. All of these transactions are fully isolated. Um, they're all fully uh, atomic, and they can all manage consistency. So a little more detail about some of the internals of Volt. Uh, so Volt is a partitioned clustered system. So uh, you define a table and schema in typical SQL DDL, and Volt will distribute the rows of that table across the different partitions in the system. Each server can have uh, one or more partitions. And so the data is split across them. And the partitions are the unit of replication. So each partition it can appear uh, a configured number of times in the cluster. Two or three are common, right? Uh, so processing. So as the user invokes stored procedures, the user serializes a stored procedure call in a binary format that we've specified. Uh, and those stored procedures arrive at a cluster. Uh, the cluster can examine the parameters of the stored procedure to determine how to route it, which partition is this procedure for, uh, and it routes the procedure to the appropriate partitions. Right? Typically, it's replicated, so the, all the replicas will get the invocation. Uh, once they arrive there at the partition replicas, they're ordered. So when the transaction was initiated, it was given a transaction ID, and the transaction IDs are uh, unique. Uh, every initiator can produce a unique set of IDs. And the transaction IDs uh, that come close together in time are also close together in sequence, so they can be sorted. Um, uh, we did this, and then I uh, didn't really think much about it. And a little while later, a year or so after, uh, Twitter wrote a paper on Snowflake, I guess it's called, which is an ID naming scheme. And it turns out that, that we both chose essentially the same algorithm. So if you want to know how this works, I think actually one of the best explanations is done by Twitter. Um, so the important point here is that you can send a transaction to any node in the cluster. The cluster can examine the transaction. It can route it to the appropriate partition and all of its replicas. And all of this replication is pure master, master, active, active. There's no, there's no inferior replicas in Volt. Uh, they're ordered there at the replica, and then they're run. And as we discussed, once the procedure starts running, it runs to completion. So there's two kinds of procedures. They both have the same ACID qualities. There are single partition procedures. These are the procedures that should be frequent, um, they should occur more frequently, right? These are the common procedures. Uh, and they operated a single partition in its replica. You can also coordinate uh, an all partition procedure in Volt. So in some of the workloads that I was describing earlier, there's a high volume of write throughput, right? Those are the single partition procedures. Those writes are essentially just changing values loosely associated to a key, right? Um, and every now and then, you need to do a consistent read. And so the consistent read are the multi-partition transactions. Uh, there's some interesting optimizations that you can do with simple multi-part transactions. Volt does some of them. So we can talk about that offline. I don't think I have enough time in 20 minutes to go into it. I've kind of walked through this slide already as I've reordered this a little bit for time. Uh, so when you run a transaction, there's a single threaded executor at each partition. I think I hinted at this, right? I said that there's, each partition has exclusive access to its data. So so we have a single threaded executor at each partition. This means that there aren't any table locks or row locks and like you would see in a classically implemented database. So there's no like deadlock detection in Volt. It's not possible. Uh, transactions run to completion. It's just code accessing memory. It doesn't take long. It usually takes microseconds. Um, and so what's the downside? Well, OK. It, the procedures can't do anything that really contravenes the assumptions that Volt makes in its design. So the tra procedure, for example, can't go talk to the network, right? Or it can't do something that's strictly in violation to the design assumptions that Volt has made. So I have an example of an extremely simple procedure here. Uh, so the procedure, it's written in Java. It declares a little metadata using annotation, declares its partitioning, and, and it describes which parameter uh, relates to which partitioned column in a table. So this is saying that the zeroth offset parameter is the tags.tag .tag attribute. 
that's, that's, that's the system route the procedure, right? So when the, when the procedure arrives at the system, the initiator can look at this parameter. It can determine which partition replicas have the associated data, and it can route appropriately. And then there is a, uh, you can't see the, oh, there we do, you can't see it. So there's a, a SQL statement. The SQL statements in Volt are static and parameterized, so they're defined in the advance when you create your application. Uh, and then you can queue multiple SQL statements in the run method. So when the procedure is invoked, the run method is called, the user can queue as many SQL statements they want into a batch, and they can execute the batch. Um, so having batches is useful for multi-partition procedures. It allows us to send a lot of statements off across the network in one batch, right, versus lots of round trips. Uh, I'd like to make one last point about Volt before I'm, I'm out of time, and that's that it's a SQL system. It gives the user this abstraction, and that allows it to use different physical schemas for some different purposes. So there's partition tables, which we've talked about quite a bit now. Volt can also replicate small tables, meaning that the full table is available at every partition. And Volt supports uh, materialized views. So materialized views in Volt are actually really cheap. If you're used to disk-based systems, they can be really expensive, right? So people sometimes have a performance bias against them. But in Volt, you can maintain running aggregates pretty cheaply. And this is one of the things that allows you to do fast queries uh, across all nodes of a cluster to come up with an aggregated result. Some of the reads that were popular and the apps that we talked about earlier. And Volt supports one, one other kind of table. It supports an export-only table. So Volt allows the user to write to a table in SQL. And an export-only table is an insert-only table. It can only support inserts. And Volt takes those writes, it serializes them, and it exposes them over the network uh, to another system. So basically, you're just writing to a stream, and you can pull that stream from another system. So this is a way that you can do enrichment. You can take a, a, a procedure invocation. You can run it. You can look at the state that you're maintaining in the system. Uh, you can calculate an answer. Uh, you can augment or filter uh, uh, some amount of data. You can write that data to an export-only table. And then the export-only table, the data, the stream kind of, of data that that table creates can be pulled uh, off of Volt uh, in JSON or common delimited files, or however you want. And you can do whatever you want to it. You can write it to Hadoop, for example. Uh, I have a quick example here of a view. It's just pretty standard SQL. Um, so I think time-wise, that's about where I get in 20 minutes. I think I've covered the two main points I wanted to talk about, a little bit about what makes Volt unique. Uh, and a little bit about some of the problems we see, and I'd like to leave some time to take questions. Okay, first, thanks to the speaker. Um, so you said multiple times that uh, VoltDB requires everything to be in memory. What happens when you run out of memory? Right, so you have to size the cluster appropriately, right? It's like what happens if your database runs out of disk. No, Volt never, well, Volt tries never to just crash. I mean, best intentions go awry, as we've learned from the previous talk. But Volt is durable in a number of ways. Volt is durable through replication. Volt also can create consistent snapshots to disk. Uh, and we're working on some logging features so that Volt can actually log the delta between what's happened since the last snapshot and the current point in time. So Volt's actually very durable. Um, how do you send the Java code through the network? Um, do you precompile the Java code before sending to the nodes? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Uh, how do you send the the Java code of the stored procedures to the oh. to the nodes? I understand. Uh, so, I have a slide for that. <laughs> so, when you develop a Vault application, I think of Vault a little bit more like a transactional data service. So, I have a little bit of a web services background, and to me, writing a Vault app feels a lot like writing a web service, and that. You write some code, you write some schema, uh, and then you run that through an assembler, basically, right? Like an application assembler, not a compiler assembler. Uh, and Volt produces an application jar from that. So to deploy the Java code to the cluster, what you do is you start the cluster using that jar, and the contents of the, of the user's procedures are in that jar. Yeah, sorry, I think I miss something in the presentation. So you said that you can uh, do a transaction on a single partition, mm -hmm. and you can do transaction on multiple partition, mm -hmm. right? But how do you do that if the partition are not on the same node? You want to do a transaction across multiple partition not on the same node, because you said you cannot do 
uh, you can read, cannot read in the network. That's right. So the user can't. However, Volt can. So, <laughs> okay, that, so the way that Volt runs a multi-partition procedure uh, is it essentially it elects a coordinator for the procedure, and then the coordinator basically just two-phase commits the results of that procedure across the cluster. Okay, thanks. That's a good question. He's first. Thank you. Um, do we have any runtime limits? Because you just said that per node you just have one procedure running. Yeah. And how do you ensure that it doesn't run forever or too long or anything like that? Uh, at the moment, we kind of leave that up to the to the user to verify through testing. Um, but it's a good point, and we could watchdog the procedures. Yes. So I'm uh, sorry, I just didn't. Hello, <laughs> guy in the corner. Uh, I just didn't understand about the non-locking scheme. So for instance, imagine that I have, you said financial services, so imagine that I have all my trades and I want to do end of the day snapshot of all the trades. So I have to go to all the trades that were ingested in a single day and aggregate things from all these trades, right, and produce a, a balance sheet that I'm going to use to do my math. How can I do that over a cluster of 100 nodes without locking and just actually having to re read all those files. I, I, I'm sorry, I just didn't understand that. If you could explain, it would be good. OK. Uh, so first of all, a Volt cluster is never 100 nodes. Uh, most of the Volt clusters that we see are relatively small, three, five nodes. You can do a lot of work in Volt on a small number of nodes. It's really, really efficient. Um, secondly, uh, if you wanted to do full table scans, you could. That would obviously be a, a relatively long-running procedure. And other procedures that were in the system would have to queue behind it, right? They would have to incur the latency of that. Uh, but what we really see is that people want Volt for real-time filtering, real-time analysis, and that they want to put the data for longer analytics, right, into a different system. So Volt is really about specialization of purpose, right? The idea is that you have things that you want to know in real time. You have things that you would like to aggregate and alert on very near the time that they happen. Uh, and you have data that you would like to enrich, maybe to put into a longer-term storage system. And those are the kinds of things that, that this system is good at. So we wouldn't really suggest that anyone try to run a complex analytic query in Volt. There's lots of tools that are much better than Volt for that. Thank you. OK, any further questions? No. Then again, thanks for the talk. All right, well, thank you very much. And there has been a little change in the schedule. The